on the recording. Yay. And um, I'll go back to the outline. <laughs> All right. Uh, and I'll be a little more careful this time. Um, every once in a while, I get this weird comment on the YouTube if I say something a little bit. Eh. Anyway, so the, the idea of the spiritual is not gendered. That's the main point. So all of this stuff about religion and gender is not faithful to the religion itself it's not spiritual it's all socially constructed but it's very powerful right so if you think the basic tenet of hinduism everything is energy energy constantly flowing and forming into different forms of uh, plants and animals and humans and um then uh, they die and the spirit is released and it's reincarnated. And the purpose of a human life is to create positive karma and to avoid negative karma and be reborn in a higher form or else actually to be released from reincarnation. So none of that has anything to do with gender, <laughs> but that's not what happened. Um, so the code of Manu is extremely sexist, right? I will read a couple sentences just to sort of remind you of what the chapter said. Um, it, quoting, it said, uh, a girl, by a girl, a young woman, or even an old one, nothing must be done independently, even in her own house. In childhood, a female must be subject to her father, in youth to her husband, when her Lord is dead to her, her sons, a woman must never be independent. Um, if a woman obeys her husband, she will, for that reason, be exalted in heaven. Um, then again, another document later on. Uh, among them all, right, lust, re, uh, wrath, greed, pride, all the other violent passions, are the sturdy arm of infatuation, but among them all, the most formidable and calamitous is a woman, illusion incarnate. <laughs> it's all her fault. Okay. The wife should think she's paying her debt of her previous life, and thus her sins are being destroyed, and she's becoming pure if she just obeys her husband without complaint. Ah, <laughs> so there, right? Okay. Um, so some of the documents are less sexist and they honor women, but men are still in control and they always define, men define women to women. They get to tell women who women are. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the document that condemns women as the source of all evil is a document that Gandhi liked. Um, he, had, he had issues with sexuality. Let's put it that way. Um, how to lead a household life is passive. The notion, religious practice, ritual. Whenever you have these purification rituals, they, they turn out to be very sexist. So women menstruating are impure. And I know that there's a number of students at AUW who um, are, live in Hindu villages and they were told, right? When they're menstruating, they can't touch certain things. They're impure. They have to isolate themselves in certain ways. Um, but another big issue is that only a boy can um, be at the funeral pyre, light the flame, and then every year engage in this ritual that keeps his father from, uh, keeps his father saved, right? So the boy is defined as having an extremely important sacred uh, duty. And if you don't have a boy, the father, when he dies, is, is karma is not going to get released appropriately, right? It's a uh, serious stuff. 
Um, so then as industrialization and development occurred, and this is true in uh, Muslim Islamic countries also, uh, women were in order to um, show that you had enough money, give yourself more status, you, you put women back in the house, right? If you're really poor, they had to be outside and exposed to the possibility of being, you know, uh, polluted by having some guy rape them. So when there was enough money, you showed your status and your piety by sending your wife home. Um, child marriage is a big issue. Um, all right. Um, the theory of nonviolence. Okay, he talks about the dowry issue. That's still an issue in many developing countries. My students talk about that. Abortion is a big problem. Females are aborted. Um, uh, kitchen fires are a big problem. They, the wife is killed so that the, the, her husband can marry another woman and get another dowry. Um, how do you overcome those traditions? And uh, the women at AUW can sort of talk about what they know about these traditions in their own countries, if they're Hindu and how it's changing, uh, what they think their generation is going to be able to do in order to bring about the change. Um, okay, that's enough, just to remind you. And then I will ask each of you to give a comment. So Untari, do you have, what was your reaction to the chapter? Prof, I will type it in the chat book. Is it okay? Oh, you don't want to say it? Um, no. <laughs> no, I mean, like, uh, it's sometimes, I think my microphone is doesn't that good. And it, it will be hard to understand what I'm saying with this microphone. I think, so I'm just going to I think if you talk slowly enough, you're okay. Okay, then I'll, I'll try. Um, what a second on this one yeah what i want to react is about the that part of hinduism in india how that women are polluted during menstruation and childbirth and they fear women's power of reproduction so they saw menstruation as a period of purification and it is treated as a taboo and what interests me is that most people, regardless if they are Hindu or not, still treat menstruation as taboo, even until now. For instance, I grew up where people told me not to mention about menstruation because it was a shame. And sometimes even told to not buy a pet in, to buy a pet in secret so people wouldn't know that I was in my period. It was even said that as a, uh, that this type of thing is a political tool to control women or something, if I'm not mistaken, it was written in the book. Yeah, that's what I want to mention, Professor. Did you, was there a certain point in your youth in high school where it occurred to you that this is a political tool, that it's a power issue rather than just it's true that you're impure? Um, no, I don't think uh, that far that it was a political uh, tool, but I just think that it was a, some kind of tradition, you, you know, like a stereotype that was just growing in the society that, and, and because people treat it as a taboo, I do feel uneasy to talk about it, but it was just uh, how the bodies work, right? It's normal, but people treat it as a taboo, so I don't know how to talk about it and I just decide to not talk about it. Okay, but yeah, I think hopefully at some point, it's one thing to say it's a tradition to eat a certain food on a certain holiday, mm -hmm. right? And yes. it's another thing to think it's a tradition to think menstruation mm -hmm. is impure, right? Yes. And, um, and when you say it, 
when I say it's political, I don't mean the politicians. I mean, it's a power issue, right? It's about power. So like a sexism society? Like right. How many, oh, okay. It's that just, makes sense. Yeah, it's one more way to keep women down, right? Yeah. And, and to also internalize that, right? Internalize that that they are impure, you know, yeah. of the month. That's very different than saying, you know, I can cook a better hot dog than you, and or I can cook a good hot dog because on the fourth of July we eat hot dogs. I mean, <laughs> that's that's not as much of a power issue, right? Except if you're forced to do it. But there's just really a big difference between a tradition that is really not to do with power and a tradition that really is. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, Professor. Okay, so Liam, which part of it uh, struck you? So it's kind of the impurity bit <clears throat> that got me because like it, it, it doesn't make sense like from a biological perspective. And I'm not a I'm not a biology major or anything. No, this is just in passing. But like it happens consistently and it's so weird. Not not the not the period. That's not the weird part. No, it's weird how it has become a tool because why? Why would that be the thing we focus on? In any way, it makes no sense. It's one of the most regular things that happens. Two humans. Leah, no, it's only one of the ginger. You want to be a philosopher? There's an answer to that question. Yeah, but do I want to ask those questions and look <laughs> for that answer? No. What is it that women have the power to do when they start menstruating? Uh, heck. Give birth. Oh, a couple right? of things. There we go. Ah, do men want to control women's power to give birth? Yeah, because they want to think they have the power over life rather than just being, you know, the passenger. It's all about control. It always comes back to it, as annoying as it is. Especially, In short, just get rid of all men. That's just the solution. Especially that power to give birth. Are there men obsessed about whether women can have access to birth control? Always. Gross. Okay, Liam. Put on your philosopher cap. Why, why, why? There's always an answer. Okay. Find a hat. I'll just get monogrammed across why, and then there we go. I'll wear that to graduation. Very good. <laughs> I'm going to, oh yeah, very good. I plan to be there, so I'll check you out and see if you really do. Um, actually, Liam, I'll wear my hat that says, make America think again. How's that? Maybe one day they will. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, if I wear my hat, okay. Um, Thomas. Okay, that's why I turned his video off. Uh, Samantha. Hi, Professor. So my thought process on all of this is just, other than exactly what Liam was saying, it's just very weird, especially on the biological part, because you would assume that it'd be celebrated in cultures, you'd want to continue on the human race. And so I found that very weird, but I also was kind of disturbed by the kitchen fires and the idea of dowries and the whole killing off your wife so you can get another wife for money. That was just kind of very disturbing, but that was also very interesting um, so yeah, that's what kind of jumped out to me. Okay, so AUW students, raise your hand if you know somebody who's had a dowry. If dowry plays a part in the village life. I've had a number of students. Uh, Rossi, is dowry an issue in your, yeah, okay. So we are in the presence okay, of- Okay, sir, can you repeat the question? Where, where, dowry plays a role in the culture it's a huge thing here it's okay. all that it's about so this is this is why i wanted right to have joint classes because yeah samantha like you're in a class with people 
who, who are familiar with that, right? That's the tradition. Um, well, how many of you have your parents have to get a dowry together for you? Okay, uh, just raise your hand. I guess we don't have all day. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so anyway, yeah, kitchen fires are still a thing. It's, it's something. Um, all right, Ross, let's see. I guess I'll go back to the beginning here. Rossi, did you have, what was your reaction to that uh, reading about women? in Hinduism. I, I, I don't know. Um, when I was reading about the women in Hinduism, I just find it like absurd when um, when they say, uh, when they talk about how to lead a household and women needs to have a passive response to abuse. I'm like, I feel like we're not animals. So like, why should we give in? Like we have the right to defend ourselves, to protect ourselves. So we shouldn't like be passive and be submissive to other people like we should be able to stand up and we should be respected for that okay and i do know a lot of the students tell me stories about their sisters their aunts their cousins that got married and then they're just treated like they have to do all the work for the in-laws family and everything right it's just it's really very prevalent um Tom. I have a, wait, um, can I share something? I have a clear, like a very, a very good example of this. Um, you know, my situation, right? So some people like expect me to do the household chores and like, um, I, in this household, um, my boyfriend's sister is in America. Like, so like both of our families are kind of modernized. So like, we, we don't care about that. And so, um, when some people come to visit and then they were like asking me like are you doing are you like cleaning are you like doing the house chores and stuff and I was like sitting there laughing and then his mom was also laughing and then like I say I help when I'm free but I'm not expected to do it and then I, I just find it like I just ask them back the question so you expect your daughter when she's married to go and clean for someone else and then she was like, no. And then uh, she, she answered me, no. And I said, then, then why do you expect, like, why do you ask me that question then? Like, why do you expect it from other people when you don't expect it from your own daughter? And so I'm like, there's no logic in your question at all. Yeah. Well, this generation of AUW students is really going to change the paradigm, right? Because they have to. They would never be able to go on if they had to do that much housework. Um, Thomas, go ahead. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect, perfect. I was having trouble getting my microphone working. I didn't mean so, to um, you of anything. I thought you <laughs> might have just stepped up, you know, to get a cup of tea or something. I did. Yeah. Um, reading through the article, honestly, my knowledge about Hinduism has been very limited. So last class and this class, I've learned a lot about the religion itself. And the biggest thing that stood out to me is the concept of karma. And I know that's not, you know, completely, you know, only in Hinduism, but it was interesting to see how it was seen. But reading this article and looking about how karma can be seen as you know, sexist with how people view women as lesser and having to repay off the sins of their past life, which is interesting to me because that just assuming that someone is inherently lesser than you seems like something that would take away karma from you. You know, that, you know, it was just interesting. And um, it really makes me think about whether if the karma system is real and whether, you know, how does being sexist towards women affect your karma? But um, that's just really what stood out to me. Okay, Thomas. So since you're interested in humanism, right? Um, think about that. Think about where the humanists, um, when they're anti-religious, they're against this kind of social construction of religion, right? And when they're against fatalism, that's another subheading of a kind of fatalism, right? So, okay. So if you want to think about it in terms of what would a Hindu humanist be like, right? As opposed to an orthodox humanist or traditional and um, just whatever you come up with, but they're those same themes, right? The people who wrote the manifesto basically know all this stuff. So then you 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 get in on the game, right? Um, yeah, I can see that. In the, in on the conversation, 
Um, okay, Alexis. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. All right, so my reaction to this was kind of just, <sighs> every work that we've done so far has just had this enormous history of sexism. It was in Christianity, it was in, you know, the Greek philosophy, it was in Confucianism as well. And it's just, I'm tired of it, you know? Like, it's just so upsetting. Like, it's not even shocking at this point. It's just kind of expected. Like, like I mean, I went into this, like in the Hinduism section thinking, okay, well, where's the, how do they oppress women here? You know? You can start anticipating it. <laughs> but the other thing is, you know, what we know of the Taliban and we hear about Islam, oh, they're so hard on women. Well, they're not the only ones. And it isn't, if you read, when we, we, when we study it, we'll see that Muhammad was way ahead of his time. So it's a lot more complex than that. Um, but I do teach a class called Women's Issues. And that one, um, <laughs> yeah, it tells you a lot. But anyway, it does give you some routes out of that. But it definitely looks at all the many, many, many dimensions of how it permeates patriarchy, but class also does. Money is hard. Um, Blaine, what did you think? Hello. Uh, sorry, sure, we'll give my mic on. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of agreeing with Alexis. It's kind of sucks, uh, predictable. But one thing that I was surprised about and also like, like Thomas, I'm also learning a lot, uh, raised in the Bible Belt, uh, kind of di didn't really know that much. But one thing that did surprise me was the very end, uh, XII, talking about education. Uh, that's 12, right? XII? Yeah. So with how, like the rest of the thing, it's like very much so the men control the women. But then at 12, it's like, oh, yes, everyone should be literate. Uh, like, you should be lifelong students. You should learn. And that's, that's a little surprising because with, like, especially, like, for example, like in American history, like, education has been used as a tool in many ways. Uh, I think one of the most notable is that of slavery. It's like, you're learning your letters, hundred lashes or I'm throwing that out there but like some I'm a little surprised that with how much the men wanted to control the women that they would be like oh yeah you should get educated which I agree with that everyone should be educated not so much the control bit but yeah education is powerful it can be I mean it is a tool to either liberate people or really enslave them right cause them to choose to be inferior. Yeah. I mean, there, there's the whole, the, the pen is mightier than the sword thing. Sometimes I, it literally is. I act, that's my commitment. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a story about Gandhi where that is related to that. But yeah, I blame you, we should really think about that. <laughs> um, Giovanni. Um, I didn't get a chance to like fully, fully read it. But I had a, like a, a little mini reaction where like I think it was something where Liam was talking about and like I totally agree where it's like I feel like when it comes to women, men shouldn't have like a say as to like anything about like their rights or anything like that because like there's never been a, a, a stage in life where men had to like ask women or even like went to women for approval, right? So I don't think women should ever have to like go for like towards men for approval for anything, you know? Okay, good. Uh, I just hope you understand that that is a radical shift. It's gonna take a lot of work on your part um, to avoid doing it in critical situations. Okay, I'm just warning you, um, Destiny. Dog. I cannot think of anything that hasn't been said. Okay. Except that maybe to comment that um, menstruation and womanhood wasn't taboo in every culture. 
it's just that um, colonization kind of overrode uh, a lot of those things for a, a lot of them. Like Hawaiian culture comes to the top of my head. I put it in the chat earlier. Um, oh. They actually revered uh, menstruating women as sacred um, goddess forms. Like, like that was a reflection of the earth and sacred fertility, but it kind of got, it kind of got bonked by colonization. Well, actually the overthrow of goddess worship too, that was incredible. Also a function of colonization. Yeah, first layer of colonization, patriarchy, and then Western colonization. Yeah, I, there's a book called Crone. If you ever want to read about that huge destruction of the goddesses and the incredible number of deaths, it's just awful. But yeah, so it didn't used to be that way. 35,000 years, right? So for 27,000 years, it was a cyclical goddess culture and then the guys started taking over. Um, Kasturi. Um, yes, Professor. So uh, when I went through the reading, I didn't find it. I didn't find anything interesting <laughs> because uh, as a Hindu, I know most of these things because like most of the things that uh, has been presented in the readings are practiced in our society. Uh, I think that uh, I would talk about Sanskritization because uh, actually there's a writer called Vanuvakta Acharya uh, who uh, translated the Ramayan from Sanskrit to Nepali. And he has also written uh, other books uh, that are related to um, how uh, how females should be, I mean, how should they be as a daughter-in-law and mother-in-law? Uh, so he has a uh, written book called Bodhu Siksha and um, uh, another book called Sashu Siksha, uh, where he explains uh, uh, as a daughter-in-law, uh, a female should um, be very uh, loyal, she should uh, not be rude, she should be very humble towards everybody, she should be fulfilling all the duties and responsibilities uh, as a daughter as well as a daughter-in-law. And uh, in the readings, we can say that, uh, we can see that according to Sanskritization, women are denied from education and training. And he, uh, he also mentions these things through poetry and, uh, whenever I uh, go through those um, um, poems written by him, I find it really interesting because he explains each and everything that a woman should be doing, uh, how a woman should be in nature through poetry, you know? I mean, uh, I'm not really sure how other people take it, but then uh, I personally love poetry a lot and I write a lot of Nepali poems. And uh, whenever I find anything expressed in form of poetry, and I love it a lot. Okay, so why don't you put that in the chat? And then um, does he reinforce uh, women's inferiority or does he try to give women a voice? It's not that he gives women a voice, but then he explains how women should be you know like uh, my, we discussed a lot of things in woman issues <laughs> subject and here as well like uh, a woman uh, however they will be in nature or education level or uh, any sort of position in jobs they will be under control of mean right okay. so he explains these things like um, uh, what a female should be like these things okay. uh, through poetry, Professor. Okay, good. And do is that still really influential in your country? Do they accept that sort of? Culture? Yeah, because like uh, uh, the rate of literacy is increasing, but then 
uh, there are still some places where people are not aware of uh, vehicles as well, you know. Uh, when I went uh, to my birthplace for the first time in order to get some documents documented, I found it uh, really weird. I mean, I felt like crying when I saw people being overwhelmed when they saw uh, uh, some vehicles uh, coming towards their village because um, in those places, most of these things that he has written in his book and uh, things that has been told in Hinduism are still practiced in most of the parts of Nepal. Even in the uh, urban areas when where I'm currently living in, uh, most of these things are implemented. Okay. It's not that education, uh, we say that education is the key to change, but then I'm not sure uh, why <laughs> Uh, Hindus in uh, I mean Hindu people can never change because uh, we have um, people from different generations in our family Be uh, in Nepal most of the families will be uh, a joint family where there will be people from different generations and uh, uh, people from older generations they are really conservative you know uh, they want their um, new uh, generation people to carry out uh, uh, and preserve their culture and tradition that's why I think um, these uh, practices are still in yeah implementation. Okay. I mean that's that's important um, I do want actually the lion students also to know that AUW has a big program in public health and bioinformatics. And the, the image there is that the students come from smaller places and they're gonna go back to these places where people are less educated and try to really make a difference, not just in terms of the health, but also the culture and the education. So, uh, so AUW, I think, was structured, you know, the ideas behind it were really Good, and, and it could make a big difference. AUW students could make a big difference. Um, all right, so let's go to environment. I'll just, um, this should be pretty predictable that um, if you, the other comment I was gonna make is that my readings are not cutting edge. They're not difficult. They're just very basic. And so, um, uh, you know, you could criticize them, but I'm, I mean, the other side of it is, it's just, I want to get the students from where they are to the next step, right? And it's just, here's just, if, if you all think this is new, then that's good. And then I do want you to know that I know that there's a lot of other stuff that's, that's more advanced than this, but this is just, it's one way to get us a 15 page assignment that touches a lot of the bases. That's my idea. Um, and maybe I can find something better, but for now that's where I'm at. Um, there's also a lot of stuff about Hinduism and conservation, but this is just a basic one. And I think the main points, I figured out how to work it into my class. So you have sort of the main themes keep coming up. Um, but it's the materialism of the West that um, uh, has sort of undermined the cultural Hinduism was much more in tune with culture and nature just because they were poor and they were, it's crowded. They did develop these cultures for how to be sustainable. Um, but this is the point that he makes. Again, we're back to that notion of the spirit that you shouldn't throw away religion, even though religion is often used to justify the destruction of nature. It definitely is. Christianity is being used that way. Um, it can be used that way. But um, do you remember when I said uh, there is a view that um, Vishnu is going to come back again, it will be the end of the world. And so that would be the fatalism that you know, if life on earth ends, that's okay. You know, it's all part of the Vishnu will come back fatalist. You don't do anything about it. Just Christianity has that too. But that's really not true to the tradition. 
and the notion of karma, positive karma. Um, and then this guy argues that you really have to keep the spiritual dimension of human culture. You can't become a purely materialistic scientist and be able to get people on board with this. Um, and and we're, that's playing out in America with COVID. Uh, this, you know, the purely materialistic scientists are saying you should get vaccinated, but there's definitely something else going on with, um, not, it's not just politics, the political rhetoric is appealing to some notion of good and evil, some notion of justice that's keeping people right from following the science. So there's more than just facts that you have to create a culture of sustainability. Um, so religion can provide the notion that, you know, you're going to be punished for destroying the creation or for creating bad karma. Religion should not be used to ignore environmental destruction or deny it or fatalistically accept it because of the second coming. Um, so he's arguing for that. Um, let's see. So there's the notion of the sanctity of life. Only God has sovereignty over this. Uh, humans should not create bad karma, right? They shouldn't inflict uh, harm so that Hindus are vegetarian, right? They're just aware of karma. God is the material cause, right? God is, is nature as well as spiritual. I mean, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And we're part of that big whole. Um, creation, maintenance, and annihilation of the cosmos. We had, remember, we had Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And Shiva only annihilates Maya. And it's Maya, it's greed and materialism that are causing this bad karma. So Shiva would want us to kill that motive and get back in touch with um, the jiva and be sustainable. Um, let's see, the flora, okay. Even the trees were um, represented as attributes of God. They had divine powers. I know that um, one of the my Indonesian colleagues in um, Yogyakarta came from a little village. And originally the village worshiped this tree. There's this huge, huge tree in the village. And they still worship the tree, even though they're Muslim. <laughs> and they also like meditate and they don't pray five times a day, but they still consider themselves Muslim. I mean, Indonesia is such a multi-religious ethnic country. It's so amazing. But they still have this uh, worship of the tree and that's, very Hindu. Hindus used to uh, control Indonesia, uh, parts of it especially, and then Buddhists, and then Muslims, and there were Christians. So, so in the villages, they have this huge mishmash of different um, systems. But anyway, so the cremation of bodies, air pollution, water pollution, um, the caste system was designed to maintain sustainability, but it got, it degenerated. And so um, a, a certain amount of India's problems is because of colonialism, but there have been these movements, defense, defenders of the environment, the Chipko movement. You can look at this online. If you want to your paper, your next paper, if you want to explore this a little more, or if you want to have it in your final paper, that works for me. Um, okay, and then, yeah. So from the perspective of many of the world religions, the abuse of nature for immediate gain is unjust, uh, immoral, and ethical. I, I do think, you know, that humanism and the spirit, the humanistic branch of each of these religions as well as secular humanism, spiritual human, you name it humanism, they ought to come together on this one point 
that you don't destroy the natural world. Um, all right. So anybody want to have any reaction to that? And I, I'm just going to call your name. And if you, you can go ahead and pass, it's no big deal. I just thought if, if this is of interest to you, it's, I want to know, you know, I'm curious. So what about you, Untari? Yes, Professor. Um, I'm just thinking about the Kasturi answer in the chat box that Hindu worship three, right? As they worship uh, three, and it's resulting that to Hindu people to more care about the environment. So it's good. The result is good. So okay. I'm just thinking about that. Okay. There is a movement. If you want to look up Vandava Shiva is very much into... Um, the, the um, kinds of farming techniques that were used in India to keep rejuvenating the land. So she and Bill Gates are having it out really because <laughs> he wants this genetically modified and boy, they're really going at it, which is unfortunate. I think both of them could be, you know, they could choose different parts of the world and be effective in those parts, but I'm not sure where that chapter is going, but um, there is this thing about ancient farming agricultural practices were designed to continually rejuvenate the land for obvious reasons. It worked for thousands of years. And so we're interfering with that. And that is a problem. Um, Rossi, do you have a reaction to this at all? No, Professor, I want to skip this. Okay, Thomas. Well, I kind of found the multiculturalism of um, Indonesia very interesting because I feel like we have parts of that in the USA. We have huge amounts of multiculturalism, but it doesn't mesh as much as what you described. And I, I think maybe only a couple examples that you could see of that would probably be in probably the East Coast where a lot of immigrants came and they meshed their religions together and not really formed new ones, but formed new traditions, new cultures. And I think it'd be very interesting to kind of look at what resulted from that and also maybe go and look at other parts of the world and see where religions mesh, like um, Christianity in South Korea, where it's a lot different from Christianity here. It's a lot more authoritarian. And um, I, I just think it'd be interesting. Yeah, actually, the last day of class, Untari, I wanted to talk about Indonesia. And uh, you're going to have to, you know, be my speak up if you think I got it wrong. But um, I really, I really loved it. And I'll explain it more to you, Thomas, when we get there. And I do think America should have a wake up call. We used to be the place that accepted people and be diverse. And we're just not. I mean, there are other places that are way more diverse and accepting and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, our, our place in the world is changing for better or worse. Uh, okay, Samantha. I was kind of thinking the same thing that Thomas was. I thought the story about what was going on in Indonesia was very fascinating. Um, it kind of reminded me of like, the mix, again, the mixing of cultures in, um, in the Northeast coast especially when Ellis Island came about and the kind of mass migration of the Irish and Scottish and the Germans and kind of how those different cultures mesh together and how they didn't mesh together but kind of I thought that was kind of an interesting take. Yeah so Untari has checked in in the chat box if you guys want to read it but incidentally you can go to California there's a whole lot of kind of Wicca, Pagan, uh, you name it so there's, there's a lot of environmentally related religions out there in California. So uh, yeah, America is many different countries, I think. Um, Leon. Any? Um, I, yeah, I don't really have anything to say. That's okay. Uh, Alexis. I also don't really have anything to say, except I think that we should have more environmental based religions. Uh, ah, very good. Um, I, I 
agree. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Blaine? I'm going to pass. Okay. Giovanni? Uh, I'll pass as well. Okay. Destiny? I don't got much, but uh, I would like to remark that the most the most common environmentalist religion that I've seen in America is usually paganism, like neo paganism among young people, and a lot of it is goddess worship too. Yeah. Okay. I have had students really in twenty five years they self define uh, pagan neo-pagan, Wicca. Uh, I had a Satanist once. <laughs> you never know what you get up there in the Arkansas Hills. Um, but it's all interesting. Um, Kasturi? Um, Professor, so uh, when Undari said that uh, uh, Hindus, they worship uh, different trees, and the consequence is a good that we can actually protect and preserve the environment. But then I don't find any sense in worshiping those trees. You know, like I know that uh, it is a good sign because we can uh, protect and preserve our environment. But then uh, what will we get? I mean, um, I don't find it uh, meaningful when our religion teaches us to worship idols they're just stones right statues and i find it really weird so in the orphanage uh, we were used to uh made to worship uh gods each and every day we had to wake up early in the morning uh clean all the dishes that we uh, had to use for worshiping and i i i didn't like that culture at all and i was always like always like why are we supposed to do this worshiping things and prayers uh, uh i mean uh, if we do some sort of prayers then we uh, feel uh, peaceful we find uh, inner peace but then what is the reason of uh, worshiping those um, idols and images uh, i used to ask my uh, guardian and he used to say that uh, in order to become a good individual we have to have fear of someone in life. So you either should have fear of some sort of God or some sort of people. So um, I'm not really sure whether all of these things make sense at all or not. But then for me, it doesn't make sense at all. And mm -hmm. worshipping trees and these idol things um, is not of my interest at all. <laughs> That's why sometimes whenever I... Um, uh, see some things related to Hinduism, I I don't find them interesting. And sometimes I think that they're, they're, they are nonsense. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. That's why I think the word worship is very patriarchal and hierarchical, right? Whereas goddess stuff, you don't worship, you get in touch, right? You get in touch with um, the earth right? It's not at all worshiping. It's sort of being aware that the tree is alive, right? It's just being aware of the, the living tree. It's not just an object for you to look at, right? Or use. It's living. It, it's part, you know, it, you're living, it's living. So it's just getting in touch with life. And again, I think that, yes. yeah, when goddesses, goddess worship ended and was replaced, then you get this notion of worship because it's hierarchy, right? Lower yeah. and higher. And that is open to the door to patriarchy. <laughs> does that I make think, Yeah, yes, Professor, it does make sense. Uh, so uh, according to Hinduism, uh, it is believed that um, uh, even though we cannot see gods in reality, then uh, it is said that uh, gods, they exist in form of animals and plants, right? 
so uh, i think that you are right i mean uh, since uh, we we cannot see gods in reality then we should uh, worship um, animals and trees because they are alive i mean gods are alive in the form of animals and uh, plants uh, i uh, for instance a uh, cow is uh, in most in many countries they eat meat of cow right but then in nepal there is a law that people um, killing cow uh, will get a legal punishment. They will get imprisonment because we worship it as uh, goddess Lakshmi and it is our national animal and we cannot eat it. Right. Okay. That makes sense. But I, um, yeah, I, I actually like goddess stuff, but there's no place to worship. A God. I mean, I don't do that, but I like the idea of just being in touch with life, living, and um, the notion of just this goddess who's who um, from whom life comes in all its forms, right? Um, emanation. Everything is an emanation from a life force, um, and that really has gotten replaced. But anyway. I hope I don't get into trouble with some YouTuber who hears me say that and comes back. Um, Poonam, do you have a comment about this article about the environment? Yeah, Professor, like same as Kasturi said, like I am also Hindu, so I don't understand uh, why we worship trees, but I believe like when we worship any kind of tree or animal, so like it give us speech in mind. So I, I think that's why people uh, worshiping tree and animals. And then uh, I think they believe in that. I don't know why we, we worship, but <laughs> we worship tree and animals. Okay, good. All right. Um, I do think it's nice that we have students who are you know, or live in Hindu countries, because then you can really get the flavor of um, the, the nature of the class. Okay, so Houston Smith's outline, again, some of the basics, which, uh, which path in life you're on, which um, path to God you would be on, uh, the four stages of life and the four stations of life. So the second reading, was about the four stages and the four stations. Um, so, um, okay, so I'm gonna talk to you for a bit about Gandhi. And it's really interesting to be talking to people who are from Bangladesh because at the end of his life, Gandhi couldn't get the Hindus and the Muslims to work together after the British left. And that's how we ended up how they ended up dividing it into uh, Pakistan and India, and then what is now Bangladesh was East Pakistan. And so of course, Bangladeshi students know a whole lot more about what happened after Gandhi. And so I'm just gonna talk about Gandhi himself, knowing that the Bangladeshi people um, have had to live with the legacy uh, positive and negative of what Gandhi succeeded at and what he failed at and how things picked up after that. Um, let's see, this, no, I don't want this. Um, wait, this is not what I, here, this is what I wanted. Um, so this is his life story and this is, oh boy, uh, we're gonna run out of time like we always do especially because I have the gift of gab, but this is interesting. I think all this stuff is interesting. Um, he was a shy person, which carries through in his life. So we have these personality types, right? Um, and he was married at a young age. We have all that arranged marriage stuff. And then um, he bossed, he and his wife never really got along the whole time. <laughs> It was always one of those sort of embarrassing things. He, he went to London. So everybody who had ambition for their children would get them teaching English 
would get them to London. This was being a really successful parent. And I mean, it's still true that the students at AUW learned English and they got really good at it because this is a tool to get successful. But he left his wife and son and he tried to imitate the British. The whole thing was about we're inferior, you're superior, we have to try to be like you as much as we can. Um, then he read the Sermon on the Mount. So I've assigned you the Sermon on the Mount. You can go back, scroll down and find it again. And I, that's, again, that's the way this class sort of fits together is the pieces keep coming back. But then he read the Gita and um, uh, this was the quote from the Gita. When doubts arise, I turn to the Gita. The Gita is about um, that Ar Arjuna had to do his sacred duty and he didn't want to kill his cousins, but he had to do it without worrying about the consequences. It's not outcome based. Um, let's see. And Gandhi thought of it as an allegory. The, the book itself has been used as a tool to justify wars between castes, right? It can be used as a weapon, but Gandhi understood it for what I think all religious literature is. It's allegorical. It's about the war that goes on inside of your soul. Um, Okay, so Krishna says the ideal action is to do your duty, which to Gandhi was to get rid of the bad karma of the British occupation and release all this positive karma. And you, you do it without reacting, with, you know, without being violent. You don't beat them at their own game. You just keep the karma positive until they go. Um, and so, and he himself was on the path of action, okay? So for him, the only meaningful life was one where you're out there acting and you're trying to get rid of this negative karma. Um, there's, let's see. Um, what did he do, right? He went back, he went, he studied in London, he went back, he was going to be this nice, westernized, educated Indian, right? He wasn't a very good lawyer, <laughs> and he was shy, right? Um, but um, so he got, he, he went, there's a great movie about this with this scene in it, all these things that I'm explaining in the outline, there's scenes in the movie. Uh, where he went to get legal assistance. And here he was dressed up in his Western clothes with his wonderful British accent. He did everything he could, you know, I'm one of you guys. And he just got treated like dirt. You know, it was so racist. And he was really surprised, right? Then he went to South Africa. He got kicked out of the first class car in a train. And those two episodes completely changed his life, right? He realized you are never going to win. Racism is racism. And um, he just started to rethink, like, why did I buy into this, right? He started to examine this superior culture, right? Um, and he started to reject it. And this, I think, is a really good quote. And I think all of you should think about this because this is so prevalent. Um, it's always been a mystery to me how people can feel honored by humiliating other people. And I've just seen it. I've seen people do this. And it just hurts me. It's like, why is that pleasant? I suppose, you know, people are insecure about themselves or something, but really, they, they can hear themselves humiliating someone else. Uh, it's just too much, but it's, you know, really unhealthy. So um, there was a war, the British versus the Dutch, and Gandhi organized an ambulance corps to help the British. They didn't want help because they did not want to admit they depended on these brown-skinned folks. Um, 
he got involved in raising his children. So he's going to start breaking down everything. He's going to break down the caste system. Um, he washed the chamber pots, right? He did the, even the chamber pots of the untouchables. So he is really, he's really starting to re-examine everything. Um, and, and he's believing this is religion, right? This is releasing all this bad karma. This, and he calls it truth force. And his word is the same word for being, right? To be, to be truth, to be true love, release of positive karma. It's all the same force. Um, so he started a nonviolent resistance movement and um, it grew. And then he, he and Tagore disagreed. Tagore said, we need to adapt Western ways in order to make progress. Whereas Gandhi was more into staying in touch with nature and being self-sufficient in the villages. Um, so, so that, that's still a major debate everywhere in the world. I think how much do you accept the Western paradigm and how much do you, you know, embrace, is that reactionary? Is that going to prevent your country from developing or is that going to help you have a more sustainable culture, whatever these questions just never go away. Um, let's see, um, all right, village uplift, okay, World War I, the Indians were oppressed, they thought that after the war ended, it would um, get better and it got worse, so now he starts using economic boycotts, right, they boycott all the, the Western run businesses. So they use economics, economic sanctions, and that is used a lot around the world to punish people. Um, it's a nonviolent way, except that it isn't really nonviolent, right? When If women and children get hungry, which happened in Iraq. Um, anyway, so here now they start being effective and there's starting to be a blowback and it's a massacre. Um, Okay, so Gandhi was worshipped. This is a problem. Uh, Confucius was also worshipped. Um, I think it's a problem when Jesus is worshipped instead of learning the lessons, right? He just wants you to exercise the virtues. But when people worship Jesus and then go off and, and don't take a good life seriously, that's not, that's not an out. That doesn't do it. Um, that goes back to Castori and her idea of worship. Yeah, putting you on a pedestal and not internalizing the virtues. But anyway, um, yeah, each person needs to take this force in themselves. Um, so then he had the people spinning their own cloths so they, they didn't have to buy the wool from Britain. So they would grow the cotton it got sent to Britain, they made it into clothes and brought, sent it back and charged them, you know, way more. Same with tea, right? Make it into tea bags and then go sell it. Um, that the Boston Tea Party was about that, um, a monopoly, monopolies. But anyway, um, then when Europe developed into fascism, that would be surprising because uh, Gandhi was old, you know, when they were in London, we're superior because we're not authoritarian. Well, then Europe devolves into authoritarianism. And it's like, huh, what was that? They're really superior. Um, and, and this one is about the salt tax. Uh, they went and got salt on these pans and let the sun uh, evaporate the water. So they had their own salt. That was another way they resisted. And then there was another massacre. Um, okay, so I'm going to read you um, a little bit from, yeah, okay. I want to read you uh, two sections, some of Gandhi's theology and then some about his, about the salt massacre and Winston Churchill and, um, yeah, I didn't. I never got this story about Churchill. What we get about Churchill is that the British stood up against the Germans, and you know, 
Um, he had them going down into the subway station under the underground while the Germans were bombing. I mean, he's the hero. He's great. Well, his attitude toward Gandhi and I mean, he was so racist. So I, you know, everybody's legacy is a mixed legacy. So I think we ought to get uh, we ought to get a fuller version of the story. But anyway, so here's his theology. Um, and if any of you want me to send this, I didn't post it because I don't have the uh, information, the copyright, you know, what book it came from. <laughs> I just did this so long ago, decades ago. Okay. The word satya means truth, right? Uh, truth is God and God is that which is. Okay. This is Gandhi sort of musing about his theology. Um, God alone is, for nothing else I see merely through the senses can or will persist. And that's very, that's very Hindu, right? That uh, Arjuna had this revelation of the Brahman as all the energy. And so Maya, what you see with your senses is an illusion. Everything is truth force. So Gandhi is very much a Hindu in that sense. Um, he did try to prove the existence of God, which is a very Western thing to do. Quote, it's possible to reason out the existence of God to a limited extent. There is an orderliness in the universe. There's an unalterable law governing everything. Um, it's not a blind law, for no blind law can govern the conduct of people. The law then which governs all life is God. And again, that's consistent with Hinduism. It doesn't personalize God. I do perceive that while everything around me is always changing, always dying, there's underlying all that a living power that's changeless, that holds everything together, that creates, dissolves, and recreates. That informing power or spirit is God. In the midst of death, life persists. Um, but he does say, faith transcends reason. So we've got this theme of the relation between reason and faith. If we could solve all the mysteries of the universe, we would be co-equal with God. Um, okay, God preoccupied Gandhi, but he never had a mystical experience. He never heard a voice or saw a vision because, you know, he was really an activist. No special revelation. Uh, God reveals himself to every person, but we shut our ears. We don't pay attention to it. Um, okay, so his, his thing was just his way of orienting toward the world was the path of action. Um, okay, so this is the point. Here is the way that religion gets weaponized. So we've also we've seen how it got weaponized with sexism. Uh, so great was the power of religion that the Brahmins established themselves as the highest caste, higher than the rulers and warriors. And this because they were able to give the caste gradations a guarantee of stability by hallowing them with the mantle of religion. They clothed caste in a sacred formula of immutable fate. You are a Brahmin or an untouchable because of your conduct in a previous incarnation. Uh, caste rank is thus preordained. So it's the same thing as with sexism, right? So now all of a sudden religion, instead of being a spiritual release from all of these human constructed categories, religion is used as the ultimate defender of all these really rigid categories that completely stifles people's uh, creative energy. You know, it turns into exactly the opposite. Um, okay, Gan uh, always tolerant and fair-minded, Gandhi doubted that only the sacred Hindu Vedas were the revealed word of God. Why not the Bible and the Quran, he said. He, he hated rivalry between religions. And then he said, I am a Christian and a Hindu and a Muslim and a Jew, right? <laughs> um, God uses many instruments 
Okay, this is Stanley Jones, uh, a, a journalist that covered Gandhi. God uses many instruments. He may have used Mahatma Gandhi to Christianize unchristian Christianity. So Gandhi's life was way more Christian than the so-called Christians who beat him up and imprisoned him and all that. Um, in South Africa, for a moment, Gandhi thought of becoming a Christian. But then he said, well, why? Uh, he asked the Christians who were trying to convert him, why did God have only one son? If he had one, why? Good old Liam, why? Why not another, right? In Hinduism, there have been a number of human incarnations of the Almighty. Why can I go to heaven and attain salvation only as a Christian? Was heaven reserved for Christians? Was God a Christian? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, I believe in the other world, there are neither Hindus nor Christians nor Muslims, of course. Um, Gandhi chided the missionaries for making Christians of hungry in Indians um, uh, who they fed, you know, you'd feed them and then go, now you should convert to Christianity. And he said, he said to the Christians, make us better Hindus, right? He could have converted many Christians to Hindus because they would notice what hypocrites the Christians are, but he didn't want them. He just said, why don't you be good Christians and we'll be good Muslims and we'll all get along. <laughs> um, so that's what I, when I went to Indonesia, one of the lectures somebody wanted me to give was we want you to tell us why America is the greatest country. And I was like, what? It isn't the greatest, you know? I mean, it's got its flaws. So, I mean, my big thing was you should make Indonesia good Indonesia and I'll work on America to make a decent America, okay? Um, each of our countries has strengths and weaknesses, but you shouldn't think that, right? You shouldn't think we all should want to be like America. I think since the election of Trump, uh, I don't know anymore. It, how many people really even aspire to being American anymore? I don't know, <laughs> but it's, it's certainly a question. Okay, so here is the story of his activism. Where am I? Oh, I've got time, but then it will probably end soon. So we'll start the next class with any of your reactions to any of this stuff about uh, Gandhi's view of God, or, got, or this thing about his activism, all right? Um, okay, so here's the story of uh, when he went to the salt mines and started the nonviolent salt demonstration. Um, Gandhi was arrested while sleeping in a tent, okay? Um, several days before he, he, his arrest, he informed the vo viceroy uh, that he was planning to raid the Dharma salt works. Um, uh, he was arrested and then um, another leader got substituted. Okay, so here's the picture. And if you see the movie, it's really amazing. 2,500 volunteers participated. Um, before proceeding, uh, the leader warned them that they would be beaten, okay? but you must not resist. Don't even raise your a hand, right? Just, you know, keep your eye on the mark, right? Um, let's see, so here's the scene that this Gandhi's younger son advanced. So here's the way it is. The salt works are over here and there's a ditch with some water in it and the demonstrators are here. And they're walking through the ditch up to the fence to um, try to break into the salt works. And um, they're getting beaten by clubs that have steel in them, okay? And they're getting beaten by other Indians because this is how you oppress people. There's like six British officials and they're the ones that order the their employees to beat their own people okay and so that you know that's 
all the time that's the way oppression works because the people who beat their own people have really good jobs right and they they get out of poverty this way their kids get educated i mean there's this huge payoff as long as you beat your own people for our sake as long as you maintain colonialism and so um so this is what happened um God, the Gandhi men drew up and halted a hundred yards from the stockade. A picked column advanced. So there were about um, 25 uh, per um, wave, right? The officers ordered them to retreat, okay, and they didn't. Suddenly, at, the, at a word of command, scores of native policemen rushed upon the advancing marchers and, and raised blows on their heads, okay? Not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off the blows. They went down like tenpins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening whack of the clubs on unprotected skulls. The waiting crowds of marchers groaned and sucked in their breath in sympathetic pain at every blow. Those struck down fell sprawling, unconscious, or writhing with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. The survivors, without break, breaking ranks, silently and doggedly marched on until they were struck down. When the first column was laid low, another one advanced. Although everyone knew that within a few minutes he'd be beaten down, perhaps killed, I could detect no sign of wavering or fear. They marched steadily with their heads up without the encouragement of music or cheering or any possibility that they might escape injury or death. The police rushed out and methodically and mechanically beat down the second column. There was no fight, no struggle. The marchers simply walked forward until they were struck down. Another group of 25 advanced. The police commenced savagely kicking the seated men in the abdomen and the testicles. Another column presented itself. Enraged, the police dragged them by their arms and feet and threw them into the ditches. Um, let's see, another policeman dragged a Gandhi man to the ditch, threw him in and hit him over the head. Um, okay, you gotta hear this, hour after hour. Okay, this went on for hours, right? Stretcher bears carried um, back a stream of inert, bleeding men, right? Um, a British officer uh, arrested her. And then this went on. This went on for days, okay? Days <laughs> over and over. Okay, so <laughs> I know I'm going to cry. I cry every time. I apologize. <laughs> But this is the power of the spirit, I think. India was now free. <laughs> Legally, technically, nothing had changed. India was still a British colony, but there was a difference. And uh, Tagore explained it. He told the Manchester Guardian on May 17, 1930, that Europe has completely lost her moral prestige in Asia. She's no longer regarded as the champion throughout the world of fair dealing and the exponent of high principle, but as the upholder of Western race supremacy and the exploiter of those outside of her borders. For Europe, this is in actual fact, a great moral defeat. Even though Asia is physically weak and unable to protect herself, from aggression where her vital interests are menaced. Nonetheless, she can now afford to look down on Europe where before she looked up, right? The salt march and its af aftermath did two things. It gave the Indians the conviction that they could lift the foreign yoke from their shoulders. And it made the British aware that they were subjugating India it was inevitable after that, that India would someday refuse to be ruled and more important that England would someday refuse to rule. When the Indians allowed themselves to be beaten with batons uh, and did not cringe, 
They showed that England was powerless and India was invincible. The rest was a matter of time. Okay, so, so that, you know, those are really <laughs> powerful, right? Um, you can use spirituality to make change. Do you remember Confucius? He had an incredible influence over people for a long time, right? Because he had that moral influence. So this is the power of the spirit, right? The spirituality can have political power, but not if it's used primarily as a tool. So Gandhi had to just engage in it the way that the Bhagavad Gita says, you know, you just do it, you don't react, you do it without calculating, you just do it. And after a while, you know, the karma, the, the British knew, right? They could see what was happening. And finally, the British people decided we can't do that anymore, right? The karma finally came back to them. Um, and then there's what happened with um, Churchill, right? The prime minister was embarrassed to be the jailer of Gandhi from all over the world. And from his own country came a deluge of telegrams asking for the Mahatma to be released, right? The whole world knows about this. Um, there was a round table conference attended by Indians who were the Viceroy's appointees. It met in London and came to nothing because the, um, the only popular organization in India the People's Organization in India was not represented, right? So, you know, we're not going to talk to those people, but we'll have this fake conference and make it look like we're dealing with people. No. So there was another conference. It was more than dramatic. It was historic and decisive. Winston Churchill saw this better than anybody. He had to go and meet with Gandhi. He was revolted, he declared, by, quote, the nauseating and humiliating spectacle of this one-time lawyer, now a seditious fakir, which means a religious leader, striding half naked up the steps of the viceroy's palace to negotiate and parley on equal terms with the re representative of the king emperor. Churchill's anger and contempt, undisguised and ferocious, did not blur his vision. He grasped the fact it was not the state of the Mahatma's undress, uh, but the equality he had acquired and was asserting in, with, in this um, conference. Gandhi had not come to petition for favors. He came as the leader of a nation to negotiate on equal terms with the representative of another nation. Um, but the British government had no intention of giving India freedom. Um, uh, Winston Churchill was prime minister. He was also, he was always guided by this claim. I haven't become the king's first prime minister in order to preside at the liquidation of the British empire. He detested Gandhi. Uh, but uh, Gandhiism and all it stands for must ultimately be grappled with and finally crushed, he said in 1935. He intended to crush Gandhi. Um, let's see. From the time he became the king's first minister to the day in 1945 when he was ousted, he waged war against Mahatma Gandhi. Um, it was a contest between the past of England and the future of India, um, and the future won out. <laughs> so, um, what, we have eight minutes. Um, does anybody want to have, to react to that? Um, anybody have a reaction? I'm just going to go quick, and then... The Merton essay, we can start next time with your reactions to that. Again, I didn't assign a lot of it. You don't have to have read it that carefully. 
and we'll go over the paper topics. So you can just sort of sit on the, all the Hinduism stuff and let it seep in a little bit. But do you have any reactions, Untari? No? Okay, Samantha? No, ma'am. Rossi? No. <laughs> Was it not impressive? Was it, did you know about any of this stuff? Um, Thomas? Well, I didn't really know about any of this stuff, but as I was learning about it, it kind of ties into the stuff that I've learned recently. Uh, just being exposed here on campus to a lot of different cultures has helped me learn. Um, I mean, especially the year one class I'm taking. It's just uh, today we had presentations and um, someone in my class um, went over how their religion would take and form in their presentation and their kind of household of minimalism. So what is the name of your class? Well, the class is Tiny Houses. Oh. It's about the ethics, morals, and kind of lifestyles that go into having tiny houses. Wow, I know about tiny houses. Who's teaching it? Uh, Dustin oh. Bullock. Okay, good. Interesting. Uh, Liam? I don't have anything, because that was a lot, and my brain is fried. <laughs> is that the reason, maybe? I hope it's not because you're not interested. That, that students are passing. <laughs> well, I think that's just, a lot, that, was, that was a lot of information. God, he's led a life. And that was literally just like a taste of Indian, like geopolitical situation. Yeah, if you want to, if you know, if the students want to get together and watch that Gandhi movie, you're gonna, it's amazing. You can imagine that scene about the salt massacre. Um, Alexis? Um, I don't really have a comment. I did find this information really interesting, and I probably would have a comment if I haven't been up since 5 a.m. Okay. Blaine? Hello. Um, I'm in a similar situation, but I will say, uh, and I mean, I think most of us at Lyon, like, we say this, like, we all grew up in Bible Belt, South America, or Southern America, rather. Um, but I do think that, uh, like, this is the first time that I've actually, like, like, learned, like, what actually happened with Gandhi. Because most of the time, anytime I've asked or try to look something up or somebody's told me something about Gandhi and, like, what will happen with that, most of the time they're just like, oh, yeah, well, there were uh, peaceful protests that were similar to riots but weren't really. They just kind of stood there, got beaten, and starved to death. And then the British and all their oppressors just kind of went away and everyone was happy. But that's not exactly what happened. So I am learning, which is nice. Yeah, not only that, Blaine, it then after they left, there was this big fight between the Muslims and the Hindus. And that was Gandhi died thinking he was a failure. And he actually got shot by somebody who, by an, a native Indian person who just disagreed with what he was doing. So he didn't get shot by a British person. I mean, it, it really, the story is pretty amazing and it's very complex. And of course, people in India still debate all this stuff. And Tagore was wanting progress and there's still, you know, everything is still very conflicted over the whole thing. It, it is really complex. Um, Giovanni? Um, I don't have anything. I was just listening and just learning, honestly, because I'm not really familiar with a lot of this stuff. So I was just, you know, taking it in for the first time. Well, the other thing is to just look at the whole history of nonviolent uh, movements. There is a book by Erica Chen Chenoweth, I think it's in the library, where she looks at all the violent versus nonviolent revolutions and what has happened in those countries after 10 years or 20 years. And um, overall, the nonviolent ones have been more effective because the violent ones just lead to revenge and more war. So that, that really is interesting. It's not pie in the sky kind of stuff. Um, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's Erica Chenoweth, if you, and I'm sure it's in the library. 
because uh, I, I bought the book when I saw her speak and I think I donated it to the library. Um, Destiny? Not to diminish um, the accomplishments of that revolution, but nonviolent resistance has never really sat right with me because it feels almost as if you are sanitizing yourself for the oppressor because there will never be a purely nonviolent revolution. The oppressor is always going to use violence against you. So why would you simply surrender your right to fight back? Okay, and that's why that book by Chenoweth is- No, I wasn't done yet. I was, oh. gonna, I was gonna say, um, of course, that does lead to violence in return, but they were going to be violent to you anyway. So I, I feel as though purely nonviolent resistance cripples itself in a way by not allowing its people to defend themselves. I don't think, I just don't understand the thought process that one would have to go to to justify that to themselves as they did it. And like, yeah, it's, it's an amazing strength of will and spirit. And I, I don't disagree that that's an amazing thing, but I, it's different to acknowledge that it is very, willful behavior and that that in itself is exceptional and to agree with doing it. I, I admire their self-control and their um, ability to rise above, uh, but I, I don't think I could do it. I, I think I would probably fight back a lot. <laughs> okay, and then also, I mean, there's different situations. I mean, I'm not a pacifist myself, but in certain situations, it seems more appropriate than other situations um, and circumstances and all of that. So I, I do think judgment calls always have to be made. Um, and in, in your lifetime, there's going to be demonstrations about Black Lives Matter. There's gonna be demonstrations about uh, environmental stuff. There's going to be demonstrations about the concentration of wealth. Um, there's just going to be a lot of stuff because there's going to be a lot of social disruption. So you will probably have to make decisions about these things. Uh, quite a few of them over your lifetime. Um, the, most, the most compelling reason I could think of, were you going to say something? No, nope, I was going to call on Kasturi, but go ahead. Oh, um, the most compelling reason I could think of would be that um, when you partake in violence, um, defensive violence in a, in a resistive capacity, that um, often provokes more violence for the people demonstrating with you. So by fighting back, you incite violence on the weaker members of your um, contingent. So- yeah. That would probably be one thing that would stop me, but I, I, I do maintain that there is no nonviolent resistance. There's only capping the violence on one side. Okay, so I, to me, everything is a subject of deliberation, right? <laughs> Making distinctions and talking about it. Um, and the circumstances change every day. So I'm gonna call on Kasturi but if people have to go right away, it's time to go. So Kasturi, do you have a reaction? Uh, no, Professor. Actually, I'm getting late for my another class as well. <laughs> so um, I will post the classwork. You know, the there's a the usual due at the end of the week. There's 10 total. So some of you might be all caught up by now. You can write your papers by now. You can write on Confucianism. You can write on Hinduism and get it over with because you're gonna get more work later on. Um, the, the third paper will be on Confucianism and or Hinduism and or Buddhism. So, okay, that's it. Um, you can go.
हाँ थैंक यू